Uh, yes, welcome uh, to the class. We're in the, uh, a few minutes into the class. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, this this highlighted part um, again. Perhaps I'm repeating myself, but those of you new to jQuery will will be tricked uh, sooner or later. When you do something like this, jQuery returns an object that represents possibly a list of objects. Okay, and you do dot on. This function gets applied on every element of the list. And the on function is very powerful. It takes, there's several forms of it. You should read the documentation. But the form that I'm using has two arguments. The first argument says what event I want to handle. And there's many events that jQuery gives you. Click, double click, key press, key up, key down, mouse over, mouse click, uh, well, mouse click is click, uh, scroll. Uh, activate, hide, show, okay? All of those events you can handle. So JavaScript can run when something like that can happen. This is for click. And next is the second argument, it's a function. Again, you see, I'm using functions as, uh, as values in JavaScript. Essentially, I'm saying, take this function and store it. Whenever I click on any cell in this the map, run the function. And what the function does, it uh, increments this variable attempts so far. So notice how functions in JavaScript can refer to variables in the scope. Okay, this is part of their power. And then all I'm doing for now is I add a debugging uh, statement there, console.log, try so far, and I'm printing how many attempts I have. Um, any questions? No questions. This is all crystal clear. Yes. Just for the variable, if you said it should be in the scope, where we should put the variable? So in, in JavaScript, this function is defined. This function is defined inside the bigger function, right? It has access to everything that other function has. Okay. In particular, this uh, these variables, uh, the table variable you could use in there, and everything else. Everybody which is in the JavaScript code. Well, not in, the job, not in the entire JavaScript code, in scope, okay? So everything that you could access in this function, so that does not include local variables from some other functions. Okay, this is a, a little bit like Java in terms of scoping, yes? Is the on function part of JavaScript or jQuery? No, jQuery, okay? Because uh, that's why you have to make a jQuery object called on. Okay, so here's one thing that I'll say, and it's hard to miss, but hopefully you'll remember it. The on function does even more. Okay? The on function will not only uh, um, will not only attach the click handler to all of the cells that already exist. It will attach the click handler even to cells that will you will create in that table. Imagine a game where a new treasure gets placed while the game is playing. Okay, and normally you, whenever you place a new cell, you have to rerun something like this to attach a click handler to it. The on function will watch that for you and will attach the click handler, uh, retract, I mean, in, in the future as well. Okay, so this is a little bit hard to get right now, just perhaps it's going to come to you when you're struggling to figure out how to do this. Switching back to JavaScript, um, I go back to my sources panel because that's where JavaScript is. And um, normally when I write the handler, the first thing I do is figure out, did I do it right? Because uh, if you miss something like this, something here, Joshua is going to take it, but it's not going to be active. It's not going to do anything. So let's click and see. OK. I clicked on the cell, and indeed, you see the Joshua debugger stopped uh, at the line where I told it to, to stop. And if I run this code, it prints in the console, tries so far one, and then uh, it keeps doing this, tries so far two. So it seems to be working. But it doesn't do what we want. We don't just want to, uh, to print this. Um, OK, so uh, what do we actually want to do? What would you say that we need to put in that handler? Knowing, knowing what the game uh, needs to uh, 
Mr. Bill. Somebody else? Somebody else? So that indicate if it's successful or not successful. Well, how do you indicate? How do you figure out if it's successful or not? Well, you check, but then you can't change the image to be something else. Yes, but how do you check? How? Check if it has the class treasure. Check if it has the class treasure. But you're using the word it. What is it? The cell. Uh, the, the, the cell on which you click. Yeah. OK? So well, there are several things we need to do. We need to figure out in this handler, where am I? Because there's one handler for all of the cells. We need to figure out which of the cells we're clicking. Okay? So, and this is where uh, I'm going to use the debugger. I'm going to refresh the game. No, actually just click. And it's going to stop there. Okay, so now I'm paused in the debugger at this line inside the handler. And this is one thing you need to remember. There's a special variable called this in JavaScript. And it plays the role of the current object, okay? sometimes called self in other languages. Um, so if you, press, if you put this in the debugger, it, it actually points to a div. So you clicked on a div. Uh, and this particular one has the class treasure. How do you find out what class this div has? while using jQuery. But to invoke jQuery, you have to first make a jQuery object. So you do dollar sign this. This takes the current uh, DOM element and makes a jQuery object. And uh, jQuery has one of its tens of functions, has class treasure. And this is true. And um, has class tres, false. Okay, so has class will tell us uh, whether um, whether we have a treasure or not. Okay, so that's the first part. The, uh, the next part is how we need to, if it has a treasure, well done. If it doesn't have a treasure, we have to uncover the cell so that it doesn't show uh, cover. And remember, we manage that to discover class. So we're going to use jQuery to remove a class. So you can check has class, you can add the class, and you can remove a class. So if I do uh, this, remove class covered, okay, notice that uh, now the element has only the class cell and treasure, and notice how in the, okay, I need to enlarge that. Okay, so this is exactly what we want the game to do. And what have I done here? I've used the inspector and the debugger to kind of uh, figure out what code I need to do, try it out, make sure it does. Now I'm going to go and program it so that it happens automatically. And that is in uh, Treasure 21. I've done that coding for you. Um, let me open it here, uh, 21, so if I go down here, so first I, I, I check whether the class has a treasure using the has class, then I remove the class, and then if it has treasure, I compute the score as the expected attempts, which is calculated statistically initially, minus the attempts so far. So the more attempts you have, you the lower your score. The score will be zero if you manage to hit the treasure in exactly the expected number. And then it, it, I'm using an alert box here to say you've won. And uh, now, I mean, we can spend the whole rest of the lecture playing this interesting game. Uh, OK, so you found it in two attempts. The score is two because Statistically, I should have taken four. Okay, now I have to refresh it, start another game. Okay, so I'm lucky today. Uh, I'm very lucky today. <laughs> okay, at this point, I suspect a bug, but no, uh, I don't think there's a bug. I'm just uh, very good. Wow, the last famous words. Uh, okay, so 
Any, any questions? I hope this gives you an idea of what you can do with JavaScript, but if you just understand that uh, you include JavaScript on the page, it can read anything from the page, and it can change anything on the page, and it can react to a lot of events, okay, then, then uh, the sky is the limit of what you can build with that kind of functionality. You just have to figure out how do I do this in JavaScript, and that's where uh, web search is going to help you a lot. Um, I attempt to click on the same spot again and again, and sometimes it still pop up that it does not even work. Okay, good. So I like people who try more than I show you. Uh, uh, so what he's saying is that he clicks after the game is over, he clicks on the same spot, and uh, yeah, the game keeps going. The handler is still there. All, I, all I've done, I've changed the class to be uncovered. The treasure is there. It's still a cell. It still has a handler. I click on it, and what does it do? It increases the attempts, the number of attempts. We don't see that because I don't have the debugger on. And you see, my score is, uh, I have 19 attempts minus 15. So, um, OK, it becomes an even more interesting game than you thought. Uh, <laughs> unintended uh, feature. OK, so that's, that's what I wanted to, uh, to show you for JavaScript. It's a good time to take a break. Then we move on to build the back end. Uh, for this game. Yeah. Uh, so for the for the team assignments, let's move on because that's too quiet. I'm going to 
Okay, so let's uh let's puzzle. How many of you know about the tool for parsing? What about uh, SCP? Okay, so it looks like, more, well, the others who don't know RC for us, is it, how do you move files from computers to computers? Um, what? SCP. Yeah. Right, use rsync. What rsync does, um, so SCP copies a file from here to there. Okay, rsync takes the same command line parameters, but first it sees, is the file already there? If it is, what is the difference? And it will only send over the difference. So you can rsync a 10 gigabyte uh, database backup on top of an older backup and it's only going to send the diff. So it's a lot faster. And if the rsync dies in the middle of a huge transfer, it's only going to continue. Next. Okay? The way it does it, it uh, let's take this, this big file, 10 gigabytes, it's going to split it into a thousand little fragments. And it's going to verify which of these fragments already exist there. So it's find out which portion of the file to, to send. Okay, so this problem is based on that. This is another interview question. You have, uh, you have 100 files <coughs> you want to send over the network, but there might be bugs. And we're going to assume that uh, there's only one error. Only one file at most uh, may be corrupted in transmission. Okay, the question is, how do you detect if any was corrupted, and then which was corrupted, so that you can tell the sender to resend just that piece. Any questions about the problem first? You understand the problem? Okay, so essentially, we want to do this with fewer than 100 checksums. Uh, okay, how many people think they have a solution? Only one. And? And then send it. Um, yeah, but if you send a bigger file over an unreliable network, the chances are that you're almost only going to have an error and have to resend the whole thing. So here I want to be able to be somewhat economical. Yeah, let's see. I uh, suggest a recursion approach. Okay. okay. So let's say you have 100 files. You take uh, 50 of them, you take a checksum of each file, and then you take a checksum of those checksums. That, that's just one checksum. So you know that, that uh, if that a corrupted file would be in that half, and then you go down and down. So you compute the checksum for the first 50 files. And then compute the checksum of all the ch 50 checksums. Why 50 checksums? Um, so then, then you get compute also on the server if those 50 checksums are also the same. Oh, so you're computing, then, you're yeah. taking 100 files, compute checksum for the first half, checksum for the second half. Then for the first half, split it, 25, 25, yeah, yeah, yeah. compute checksum, yeah. checksum. That okay. would be long. How many checksums do you have? Uh, you, 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 you originally need me to send like 100, and now you need to send, I don't know, like uh, 2 to the 8. So it's like 8 of, or seven, 8 or 7. How, how many checksums do you have if you personally compute the checksum of the full hundred files? No, next? I'm not like taking checksum of all okay, files, fine, but fine. Checksum, so of checksum. checksum of 50, checksum of 25, 25, 12, 12. So it's a binary tree. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. How many leaves in a binary tree? I'm not sending everything. It's, it's about 99 checksums. <laughs> no, I'm like, uh, I send. If if the server is wrong, then, then it's sent back and, and like 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 uh, I would check. I would send only that. Oh, you have multiple. Uh, I would send only that branch. I won't send the whole tree. But 
how can the server tell you which individual file needs to be resent if you only send the checksum of the first 50? It can tell you yeah. that there's a, there's a bug no, in the first 50. I mean, 50. like, uh, you're maintaining a long socket, and then they commu communicate. Okay, so you want multiple yeah, there communications. Are multiple, yeah, there uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> I want only one communication. <laughs> Pairs. Pairs overlapping by one. One and two, two and three, yeah. three and four. How many checksums are there? <laughs> okay, you say some. You're making some progress. Okay, uh, I, I won't give you the answer just yet. Um, and this is a little bit fast to do it. Um, in, in an interview, I want to have this communication with a person and prompt them a little bit. Uh, and more than seeing whether they know the answer, I want to see how they think, how they think with incremental help or insights and all that. So the most important thing for an interview puzzle like this, um, well, either if you know the answer, well, then, okay, it's easy. You just have to make it seem like you invented it on the spot. But uh, if you don't know the answer, don't get scared. Uh, try to enjoy the process, because this is what they're looking for. They're not looking for people with a big bag of known puzzles. They're looking for people who kind of enjoy challenges and you know uh, like to, to collaborate on finding a solution. So I'm not going to penalize you if you don't know it. But uh, think about this. And uh, you may want to use Piazza or send me an email if you want to engage further with this. Uh, but the answer is about uh, eight checksums. Yeah. Uh, no, seven. Okay, let's uh, switch to uh, a different style now. So uh, what I'm going to do next, I'm going to start switching from what happens in the browser <laughs> to what happens on the server. Uh, but, and I have a few slides uh, for you to kind of set the stage, because this is a little bit of a different kind of technology, different kind of concerns, different kind of programming languages, uh, everything, it's a little bit different. Um, but, I, but I do have a, a summary of JavaScript and jQuery here on the side, just before we move on. Uh, so I've shown you the, the basic uh, elements of JavaScript, the dynamically typed uh, programming language. It's very powerful as a language on its own, but truly its appeal and power and popularity comes uh, with its tight integration with the browser. Okay. That's really uh, where it shines, and it's the only language. If you want to make changes in the browser, can't use Ruby, can't use Python, can't use Java. You have to use JavaScript or uh, ActionScript if you're willing to load the Flash plugin or C Sharp or Silverlight plugin. But those are pretty much your your choices. Uh, there are lots and lots and lots of JavaScript libraries for pretty much everything that you can think of. I shown you jQuery. It's one of the oldest libraries, and it's still very popular because it kind of serves. It does something uh, quite well, and people build on top of it. Um, you will probably also want to use things like Bootstrap, Angular, whatever. Um, the sky is the limit what you can do, and many of those things include jQuery. Um, it's an asynchronous language, um, and there's two parts to it. Half I can. And we've already seen there's lots of functions created as first class objects and passed around storing data structures that allow you to run some code later. Okay? That's part of asynchronous. But uh, I'll show you more of this as we build the back end and we we'll start building communication between the JavaScript and the back end. That's what async is going to be a lot clearer. And uh, okay, use the inspector. I used Chrome with the built in inspector. Safari has one as well. Uh, almost as powerful. Uh, for Firefox, there's, there's something called Firebug, which does uh, pretty similar things. They only differ in the exact placement of the windows, but the conceptually, they do the same thing. Yes? Uh, when the browser renders the HTML page, like uh, if we do a query with uh, JavaScript, we are changing the HTML code. But the browser is refreshing like, at a certain rate? Or you know no, the browser is not refreshing at a certain rate. So you know that there is a modification and then you refresh the page? No, so if you, if you run JavaScript to change the HTML, you don't refresh the page. Because refreshing the page means getting a fresh HTML yeah. from the page. You lose everything. Not okay. But it renders the page. It re-renders the page. 
redraws the page, yes. But it doesn't talk to the server to get the new. So JavaScript can tell the browser to get the new page from the server, or the user can refresh the page. So each time there is a JavaScript, it's telling to the browser to re-render the page? Yes. Okay. Yes, the JavaScript interpreter kind of works very closely with the renderer. Okay? When the renderer does something, sometimes it tells the JavaScript, I'm done. When JavaScript does something, the renderer says, oh, I need to make changes to the page. They kind of work together. OK, uh, moving along. Uh, so far, we've talked about what happens in the browser and the front end. But I want to now step back and take a look at the web application in its entirety, uh, front end and back end. So I'm going to have here an animation to show you the sequence of, of uh, events or how this communication happens. At the top of the screen, we have whatever sits on the client side. And at the bottom, whatever sits on the server side. And they're going to talk uh, a protocol called HTTP. Well, I have a slide about it uh, in a bit. But uh, just so that you understand, the client will have a layer that talks HTTP, and the server will have a layer that talks HTTP. These are not things you need to program. These are already there for you. This is built in your browser. The part that kind of formats HTTP requests, sends them, waits for the response, and such. This, you won't have to program. It's built in web servers, which will be one of the uh, components that you use with your backend. Okay? So you typically program what happens somewhere deep in the backend, but not, not the ingress part. And uh, so typically, the interaction starts with a user either entering a URL or clicking a link. And that makes this uh, HTTP client side, the browser, send a request to the server. The request goes through the HTTP, gets parsed. The backend decides what to do with it. And as part of the response, you typically retor return uh, HTML files, CSS files, JavaScript files. Those go back to the, to the browser. And the browser contains multiple components. One is the HTML CSS renderer, which draws on the screen. And that's going to interpret HTML and CSS. And there's a JavaScript interpreter, tightly coupled there. Okay? And then the JavaScript in interpreter will typically, uh, this JavaScript file will typically start some code to run and will set some events. Okay? Most often, uh, these applications just sit there waiting for events. I mean, if you don't click anything, most often they do nothing. When you start clicking, well, either it's another one of these click on the link, it goes back to the back end. Or JavaScript interprets, uh, handles the click, and does something. Okay? And JavaScript itself can do several things. We've seen so far that it can, it can actually affect the HTML and CSS. But I, I want to now show you another feature of JavaScript. And that is called, um, well, actually, I have, it has two features. One, JavaScript can, can uh, navigate to a new page, can load a new page can uh, initiate the loading on a new page. So it's like the user click. Uh, it looks at the back end very similar. And the back end is going to return HTML and CSS. Uh, and uh, you can essentially simulate user clicks. But also, JavaScript can make what's called an AJAX request, which we'll, uh, we'll see in a bit. An AJAX request, it's also a request to the back end. But the back end is essentially instructed not to return HTML and CSS but return only data. Okay, So imagine uh, you're using Gmail. The first time you go to Gmail, it goes to the server and loads the HTML for the page, the JavaScript that's going to be powering the page, and the CSS. Okay? And then the JavaScript takes over. And when you start doing uh, you know, various things on the page, uh, sometimes JavaScript will ask the server to send more data, more emails, uh, or uh, your contacts list, and such. Okay? So those are AJAX requests. We will we'll look at them. So what comes back uh, are files of type e, XML, or JSON. And we will see what that is. Those are essentially data representations. And finally, as we've seen, the JavaScript can actually affect the HTML. So this is kind of the flow of, uh, of events. Uh, uh, events go to JavaScript. JavaScript can navigate to another page, can ask data uh, from the server, can change the HTML. So far in our game, we've seen only this part, 
We've loaded HTML and JavaScript, and then all interaction was between these two components, with the JavaScript interpreter handling the clicks and making changes to HTML. But to really make your web applications fully you know, um, functional, we'll have to add this other communication channel. And one more thing I want to, uh, to add, the browser is not the only possible front end for a, for a web application. You can have native apps uh, that act as front end. So if you write an Android application, it will has, have its own renderer. It doesn't render HTML. It renders some other language in which you describe the layout. It has something like CSS to describe the styling. And it has something like JavaScript to actually add functionality. For Android, that's going to be code uh, written in Java. For iOS, it's going to be code written in um, Objective-C. For, uh, for Roku, if you, do you know what the Rokus are? Uh, do you know what language you program those in? OK, it's better that you don't know. Uh, <laughs> it's, uh, it's called uh, BrightScript. And it's a version of uh, Visual Basic. And I can go on record saying it's an awful language. Um, but anyway, any platform like this has its own programmable language. Um, but the Xbox, you can program in a language called Lua, and so on. Um, and many, many platforms nowadays, uh, almost all TVs that you can buy nowadays have JavaScript interpreters in there, in which you can program all those apps, like HBO app, um, games, uh, they come, they, they're programmed in JavaScript. Okay, so what happens in the native apps, uh, I'm not showing the rendering part, but they also make requests for data to the server, and then they figure out how to um, render that. Okay, so seeing this kind of architecture uh, picture, that kind of tells us what we need to do next. We need to, on the client side, we need to figure out how to make these data requests. I haven't shown you yet. Uh, so that's one piece we'll have to learn on the client side. But I want to switch my attention now a little bit to the backend side. For the backend side, we need to learn a little bit about HTTP as a protocol. How is this getting from here to there and back? Uh, we will learn a little, a little bit about URLs. Uh, how can you encode in the HTTP request what data you want? And then we're going to switch our attention to the backend. How do you actually process these requests? And if you notice, the backend gets two kinds of requests. Requests for HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, these are going to be requests for files that typically sit on the server. And this is how the web existed from the beginning. There were a bunch of files on the server. You had URLs that named those files. And all the, the web server would do, find the file, and send it to you. Okay, No real processing. The real interesting part comes for requests like this. Uh, where the backend has to respond with data. That's typically data that is computed dynamically by the server. It's not data that's already in a, in a JSON file stored in the server. It's data that changes every second depending on who you are, what's in your shopping cart, and so on. Any, any questions so far? This is a little bit of a, of a map where we're going to be going next. So we go to HTTP, then, uh, then URLs, and then down into the backend. So HTTP, I assume uh, you know a lot about it, so I'm going to go pretty fast. Uh, raise your hand and ask a question if something is unclear. Uh, HTTP is a protocol, which is essentially a set of rules that the clients and the servers agree on as to how to package the data, when to send it, how to send it, and so on. It's built on top of TCP. TCP is a low-level protocol, which itself is built on top of IP. But what TCP gives you is essentially a reliable connection and stream of bytes to another server. So if I have an IP address and a port number of another server, and that other server runs a, a, a server process on that port, I can establish a connection. And once the connection is established, I can send bytes. Send, a, send 100 bytes, send another 100 bytes. And the server receives bytes and sends responses. Okay, It's a pipeline to which you send bytes. What bytes you send, it's, uh, TCP doesn't care. Okay? On top of TCP, there are many protocols. HTTP is just one of them. Okay? Uh, and, and there are others as well. Um, TCP has a notion of ports. 
and uh, the, TCP, the HTTP designers had picked port 80 to be the, the standard port uh, for HTTP access. It's a privileged port because it has a number less than 1024. This means that you have to have some root access, some administrative access on the server to start an HTTP server on this port. Um, uh, which is why on my testing machine, I don't use port uh, 80. I use ports higher than 1024, which you can actually use as a regular user. Uh, but your, your actual final application should, should use port 80. Uh, because in fact, many of your users, if they sit behind firewalls at their workplace, uh, they might not be able to uh, have traffic on other ports than 80. Typically, firewalls don't allow that. And there's also HTTPS, which is secure HTTP, uh, which defaults to port 443. So all URLs that start with HTTPS, really, the default port is 443. And this, uh, it's a more complex uh, uh, protocol that, that includes a handshake where there's some uh, secret keys exchanged. And uh, uh, what HTTPS does, it ensures server authenticity. So essentially, if you're going to www.google.com on HTTPS, before you even get the, HTTP, the, the files transmitted, uh, there's going to be a handshake between your browser and the server. Your browser is going to ask the server, send me your uh, certificate to prove that you are Google.com. I don't want, by some mistake, my traffic to end up at, you know, spoofing.com. And, and, and I, I think uh, I'm going to Google. So Google is going to send you back a, a file that they bought from a certificate uh, issuer. And your browser is going to compare that file with uh, what they think it should be and say, yes, you are Google.com, or at least you own the certificate that Google has bought, so that's good enough for me. And then it, it goes on. So um, any questions so far? No? OK. Uh, what is HTTP? So HTTP is simply uh, a format for deciding what bytes you send over to the, cloud, to the server and what bytes the server will send back to you. And there's two parts of the protocol. There's the request. The request goes from the client to the server. And this is an example of a request. So literally, these characters with new lines get sent over the TCP connection. So it starts with uh, uh, the request type or the method in capitals. And this could be get normally. Uh, it could be post. It could be put, delete, and, and a few other things. Okay, uh, we'll, we'll discuss more about these. Then it's the actual path um, that you want from that server. And then it's the actual version of HTTP, 1.0, 1.1. And then there's a bunch of headers. Uh, these headers, they all look like key, colon, value, all on one line. And then one per line. And then there's a blank line. And then there's the more, more stuff you want to send to the server, it would come after the blank line. But most requests to the server are of this simple form. Give me that resource. Give me that file. And the response typically is heavier, has more stuff. But the requests typically are light from the client. Uh, looking into uh, typical headers here, we see the user agent. This is a, an identifier for your browser or your client. Okay? And it's actually quite handy for the server. You can typically tell for statistical purposes or even functional purposes, is this an iPhone sending me the request? It's a, it's a browser running on Mac, maybe in Chrome, and maybe in version 20 of Chrome. And that's all encoded in these user agents. These are actually pretty long strings. Um, then uh, if modified since, this is a, a header that has to do with, with caches. Essentially, what the browser says, but if it includes this line, it says, look, give me your index.html. What? You should know that I have a version of your index.html that I had cached on Friday, December 31st, 1999, you know, pretty close to midnight. So the server gets that information and says, this client wants index.html, and they already have this version. So they're going to check their version of the file. And if their file is not newer, than what the client has, it'll just send a few bytes to the client saying, use what you have. 
because that's the latest. Okay? Or it's going to say, oh, here's the file, and you should update your cache, by the way, because this is a newer version. Okay? So this is all part of the HTTP uh, protocol, but pretty much you won't have to deal with that because these pieces that they'll um, do HTTP client and server uh, will, will deal with that. And there's many more headers that you can put, and you can even put your custom headers. Since you're writing the client, and you probably write the server, you could decide to invent a new header that means something for your application, and you just put it in there, and uh, that's fine too. Okay, uh, I don't know if these colors are a good choice, um, but uh, anyway, this is the response. The response starts uh, with a pretty standard line uh, in which the most important part here is the 200 number. That's the status code. And the status code, there's, there's a list on the page, on the web that you can uh, find. Status code 200 generally means OK. This is the standard response that the server is going to send you OK, and then it's going to send you some data. Uh, there's a whole family of status codes that start with 300 that are used to say it's OK, but uh, you should know that, uh, so for example, 304 is what the server will send you if it decides that you should use your cached version. It means, yeah, uh, use your cached version, 304, and no data. There's other things I forgot, 306, 307, these are redirects, saying, well, I don't have the file, but this other server has it, so you should go ask this other server. That's all a part of the protocol. 400 and 500 are errors. Uh, 400 are errors, application level errors, generally. So you're going to be programming. When you write your backend, you're going to be deciding to use uh, whatever error, 413 or whatever. And 500 are um, errors that often the, the web server is going gonna, is gonna to have for you. Any, any questions? OK. Uh, two things I, I want to actually show here, and I apologize if you can't quite see this. Uh, the response also has uh, headers. Okay? A uh, very important header is content type. There's a whole uh, convention for content types that essentially tell the browser what I'm sending you is an HTML file or is a JPEG image or is a movie, and you should interpret it accordingly, uh, or it's a JSON or XML file. Then there's a content length. The, the server says, I'm going to be sending you 19 bytes of data. So as the client gets these bytes, it reads the headers, then there's a blank line, and after the blank line, it's going to try to get 19 bytes of data. And that's actually the content. Notice this is a little HTML in there that's being sent. Okay. And uh, so this is important because if you know TCP, uh, you can't send the whole file in one, in one go. The TCP has packets of a maximum size, so you have a one gigabyte movie to send, you're going to tell the client, there's a one gigabyte, there's a billion bytes that you will be receiving, but they will, they will be coming a little bit at a time. So the client will be sitting there and waiting to listen on that connection until it gets a billion bytes. And that's how it knows that the file is open. OK. Uh, questions? Questions. So let's uh, move along. One thing that I showed you in the request is the URL and URI. And you might you have heard of URLs and URI. So uh, a URI is simply an identifier, it's a, some sort of a global name. And uh, for example, uh, this ISBN names they are URIs. They identifies publications. Okay, this kind of URI identifies a resource on the web, also called a URL. Okay, so URL is a special case of URI. Some people use this interchangeably. That's OK. If you're in the context of the web, you know that URI is probably going to be a URL. Uh, what the difference between them, this identifies the book, for example, with ISBN. It doesn't tell you how to find it. Okay? It's a unique identifier, but you don't know to which library to go to get it. While the URL includes not just um, there's a mistake in here. Not just the file that you want on the server, but the name of the server. And the name of the server is hierarchical. You know how to essentially 
uh, region as well. Okay. Uh, I want to spend uh, one <coughs> slide on decoding URLs because uh, they can contain quite a bit of information and you might or might not have seen all that. So this is the general structure of a URL. It starts with something called the protocol or scheme. Typically this is HTTP or HTTPS. It has a double backslash and then it's the name of the host, server.com. Okay? So this is where you start to make a connection. You take this name and you do something that's called a DNS lookup to find its IP address. Okay? There's a service that will convert these names into IP addresses. Then you take that IP address and you establish a connection. And there's routing on the web that knows how to get that server. The next part is the port. Okay? The IP address is all you need for an IP level connection. If you need a TCP connection, you need to specify a port on the remote machine. So you get it from the URL. And if it's missing, then you take 80 if the scheme was HTTP. If the scheme was HTTPS, you use 443. Um, and so far, with this information, you are establishing the TCP connection. What comes next in the URL is something that's very specific to that, to that server. Uh, the part next in red is called the path. And it's a slash separated sequence of names that look intentionally like, direct, like files in a directory structure. But they are not always. Okay? It's just a string which the server receives and it can decide how to interpret it. And sometimes they will interpret it as uh, files in their directory, but sometimes they'll do completely different things. Okay, so that's the path. And then there's a question mark that's optional. After the question mark, you have a bunch of key value pairs. This is a way to send additional information to the server. It's called the query string. And sometimes uh, you will do that. Uh, so this says parameter 1 has value 1, parameter 2 has value 2 and they're separated by ampersand. That's called the query string. And finally, this sharp sign is uh, called the anchor. This is also optional. This tells you that this is not sent to the server, by the way. Uh, everything, this, this is the part that's sent to the server, from the path to the query string. And the server interprets that and gives you back some data. The anchor is used by the browsers to position itself within the data. So if you get the big HTML page, you can have anchors like the headings. And this tells you, load the page and then immediately scroll down to a particular section of the page. So that's, that's what the anchor does. Um, and uh, one more thing I need to tell you, these URLs, they contain some special markers. There's colons, there's slash, question mark, and equal, sharp sign. These are all special, have special meaning. So if you want to have a path name that contains equal or sharp, or if you want to contain, have parameters or values that contain the special characters, they need to be escaped. They need to be translated into, uh, into another language. Uh, so this is an example of escaping the, the string $5 for me. Maybe this is the name of a file on your server. It could be. Uh, so each of these special characters, dollar, space, get converted into a percent sign and then a hexadecimal number, which is the ASCII code. So this is the dollar, um, then it's five, it's the five, then uh, 20, so this is the hexadecimal code for space and so on. Okay? There are libraries to do this for you. Uh, and if you use Rails and Django, they'll do it for you even um, without you having to do it explicitly. Do you have any questions here? Okay. Uh, so what follows next is I'm going to switch back. This is in the, in the next lecture. I'm going to switch back to the third part of the hands-on lectures. We're going to go to another script where we build the backend uh, for the game. And just to give you a preview, the backend is going to be doing two things. First. Um, you can't, the game will contact the backend to find the initial game parameters. How many rows, columns, and what percentage of treasures they should start with. When you finish the game, the front end is going to send the score to the backend. And based on how well you've done and how many games you've played, 
the backend is going to respond with the parameters for the next game, a little bit harder game uh, for you. And so the backend stores the parameters for the game and controls essentially the, the experience. Um, so that's kind of a, uh, allow us to explore what backend can do. Okay, so that's it. Uh, see you uh, next uh, next week. Yeah. Oh, I will send you to me. 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 I will send you to me.